Clevenger. The Richard Strauss first horn concerto could be played in any number of different performance situations, and one of those would be for an audition. For people in the performing arts, an audition is comparable to a job interview. Remember that an audition demonstrates how you play at a given moment of just one day, and while that may not be entirely indicative of your abilities, it will determine whether or not you are chosen for a particular position. At every level of performance, whether you are applying for admission to a music school or conservatory, seeking to study with a favored teacher, or entering the music field professionally, auditions are both a necessity and a reality. Many people start to play various instruments in grade school, junior high or high school, and hundreds drop out along the way. Others continue into college or conservatory, but very few withstand the test of time, energy, dedication, and love of instrument in order to play professionally. If and when you've progressed so far as to invest in a fine instrument, choose a wonderful teacher or teachers, and be compelled, as I was and still am, to play professionally, you will have to pass through the eye of the needle, so to speak, during that traumatic ordeal called the audition. There are many things to consider before taking an audition. First, are you indeed ready to play this job? You must be thoroughly prepared in the craft of your instrument. That is, technique, versatility, all the physical demands. But more important than technique or craft is the art form, musicianship, artistic preparation. You should seek advice about your level of ability from a teacher or colleagues, as well as a critical self-analysis, a comparison to other students and professionals to determine if you are prepared. There are also other important considerations before taking an audition. Do some research into the particular orchestra for which you will audition. What style does that orchestra play? And is the way you play compatible with it? You may be able to determine this from recorded or live performances. Of course, hearing live performances is best. You should think about the particular position that is available. Perhaps a wonderful orchestra has an opening for your instrument, but are you really interested in playing that position? 
you should determine the duties of the position so that there is no misunderstanding about what the job entails. Do you want to live in the city where that orchestra is located? Is the salary enough to live on? Sometimes it's not. There are, of course, some students and professionals who are so dedicated that they would work for anything. In addition to the salary, you need to know the orchestra's schedule, the hours, the services that are required. If possible, you should be familiar with the orchestra's conductor and the repertoire that will be performed. For example, opera orchestras rarely play symphonic repertoire, so you will need to be familiar with opera literature. In an opera orchestra, you can expect a very different schedule, longer rehearsals and performances, and always performing in the orchestra pit. There are lots of reasons for moving from one orchestra to another. Perhaps a player desires an upward move from a lesser to a more distinguished, better paying orchestra. Sometimes it's a lateral move, as you just want to live in a different city, play under another conductor, or just play in that orchestra, provided an opening exists. Sometimes it's a downward move in orchestras, but an upward move in positions or salaries. Travel costs for preliminary auditions are usually borne by the auditionee, by you. A careful consideration of the many items that I have previously mentioned may help you to avoid unnecessary expenditures. Now that you have dealt with many of the practical considerations of deciding to take an audition, you should determine how you can best prepare for the moment that you will actually play the moment of truth. In my demonstration, I will be discussing specific excerpts from the symphonic literature for French horn. However, the concepts that these pieces will bring to light are universal to all instruments, and you should be able to apply them in the preparation of any audition on every performance, on every level of performance. When an opening occurs in an orchestra, it is usually advertised in the International Musician, or in Europe, in Das Orchester. If you are interested in the position in that orchestra, then you will want to send a resume to that orchestra. Remember that the resume will give a first impression, and for that reason it should be neat, legible, and as impressive as possible. In the case of some students, the resume may not be lengthy, in the Chicago Symphony, we look at the resume more as a matter of information and interest. Occasionally, we will send letters which are intended to discourage those who appear to have too little experience, but they are not forbidden to come. Some orchestras, however, do paper audition. Determining from the resume those who will be chosen to audition. Whatever their reasons are, and usually it is a time consideration, these orchestras often miss out on very fine players using this process. You cannot make a musical judgment by looking at a piece of paper. And in the Chicago Symphony, we listen to everyone who chooses to come. When you come to an audition, it is very important that you be on time. Often you will, you will not be assigned a specific time but will be expected to play within a certain time period. If for some reason you are not able to make the audition, you should inform the orchestra. When you arrive, you will usually be taken someplace backstage where you can warm up. Auditions these days are usually on the stage where the orchestra performs. There are still auditions that are held in hotel rooms or in ballrooms or in conservatories, but most of them are held on stage you'll have the opportunity to warm up. And it is important to know beforehand what amount of warm up is proper for you. You should have already determined this by practice auditions, perhaps for a friend or teacher, playing straight through the requested material. I can say from personal experience that I sometimes warmed up too much. Then after auditioning for about 20 minutes straight, nothing would come out. 
I was too tired. Remember that in an audition, there will not be much rest time. There are as many different warm-up techniques as there are musicians. Often, you will be in the warm-up area with other audition candidates. Don't serenade each other backstage. Don't play concertos for each other. Don't show off. And don't be intimidated by those who do. They often do not play their best when they get on stage. Warm up simply with steady, quality tones, melodic scales, and smooth arpeggios, not pyrotechnics. Just keep it simple. Some type of committee usually listens to your audition. In the Chicago Symphony, we have a committee of seven elected by the orchestra. The committee then appoints one additional person from the general section involved. Also, the principal player of the section will be there, nine in all. Many preliminary auditions are now behind screens so there can be no prejudice by sex, color, religion, or whatever. And nobody can be selected on the basis of being a favorite student of someone in the orchestra. The finals, however, are usually not behind a screen because you will often have to play with members of the orchestra and take directions from the conductor. Sometimes in the very final audition, you will actually play with the orchestra or members of the section. Since you will be visible, your dress, your posture, and your general deportment will be noticed. This kind of slouch looks like you don't care and does not make a good impression. When you're trying out the concert hall, just before your audition, you're usually allowed to play a few notes to assess the acoustics. You don't have to play a concerto, just a note or two or nothing at all. Something like this might be appropriate. Not too long, not too short. It's quite efficient to do it that way. From the moment you begin to play, you will be scrutinized to the nth power as you never have been before. In general, the first thing that the conductor and the committee will be listening for will be evenness and steadiness of tone on both single notes and within a phrase. You must sound reliable, dependable, very consistent, and very convincing. When you're playing an audition, you are presenting yourself to those listening. You are selling yourself. You are selling a product. Your primary product is your tone, your sound. Just as an actor communicates with his voice, his body movements and facial expressions, we communicate when we play our instruments. We make statements. We must not sound like we're asking questions. The committee, the audience, needs to know that you have a definite idea of what you're communicating, a definite plan. If you're able to concentrate on what you are saying musically, then the other external factors become less important. And your anxieties, some people call it nerves, will be much more controllable. Repertoire is chosen for every instrument to show off areas of expertise and to expose the weaknesses of a less prepared or less talented player. For example, you may find the first movement of the Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony on a violin audition. For the double bass, 
the variation from Britain's Young People's Guide to the Orchestra. On an audition for E-flat clarinet, you will have to play Till Eulenspiegel by Richard Strauss. For bassoon, the Rimsky-Korsakoff, Scheherazade, is a must. And for the trumpet, the beginning of Pictures at an Exhibition by Mazorksky. When you study each of these examples, it is important to remember that they are chosen for specific reasons. And when you prepare for an audition, you should be able to determine why each excerpt has been chosen for your instrument and play them, perform them accordingly. As I have already mentioned, the committee will be listening very closely to your tone. In addition, there are two other very basic elements of music that they will be listening for. Rhythm and intonation. As you play very well in tune and in rhythm, from the very outset of the, of the audition, the committee then listens to other details and almost takes for granted good rhythm and intonation. However, if you do not play in rhythm and in tune, you are out right away, finished. Out of 100 players auditioning for one position, we can cut the number down to five or 10 people simply on the basis of rhythm and intonation. That is how important they are. Usually a first piece in an audition for principal horn would be a middle register lyrical solo demonstrating a smooth line and a lovely, beautiful singing sound. Something like the Brahms Third Symphony, the third movement, would be a very good choice. I'll play it for you. This same phrase would appear in a cello audition or flute or other woodwinds since they all play it in the same movement. There are some things that we definitely do not want to hear in this piece and I'll demonstrate a few of them. Both of the rhythms, I hope you noticed, were incorrect. The first time, the 30 seconds were too short. The next time, I played them like triplets, too slowly. Another example of this kind would be the dotted rhythm in the second movement of the Beethoven Eroica Symphony in the minore section on violin. There's also the effect that I called the toi, -toi the notey playing that interrupts a smooth line. Listen to this. That is simply not acceptable on any instrument. And anyone playing like that risks not getting the job. When we hear someone play like that, we don't have to hear anymore. We're not interested. We just don't want to hear that effect. And now another demonstration of something that we do not want to hear. Notice that I played the written F, the concert, B flat, too low, too flat. That either shows careless intonation or it shows that the player really doesn't know that they're playing out of tune. In either case, it's unacceptable. 
As for intonation, there are four things that you must know as you prepare an audition. Know at all times what key you're playing in. Know what note or degree of the scale you are playing in that key. Whether it's the third or the fifth or the seventh and so on. Know where that note belongs in diatonic intonation. And know your instrument so well that if, for instance, you're playing a note that needs to be a little high in a certain passage, and on your instrument it is low, it will be out of tune. And it will be assumed that you do not know where the note belongs. For instance, in this same Brahms solo, the third note of the solo, the concert E flat, is the minor third of C minor. It cannot be a flat note. It would sound like this. It should sound higher. And you can observe the difference by observing the tuner as I play these. The higher pitch is more correct and therefore preferable. You cannot let your instrument speak whatever comes out, as very few instruments are that well in tuned, tuned at the factory, we say. Now listen again to the Brahms solo as I would like to hear it on an audition. You hear the performance, you hear the predominance of the lyrical line. The next piece you would probably play would be something like the Beethoven Sixth Symphony, the Scherzo. This demonstrates rhythmic integrity, as the solo must be absolutely in time in the context of what the rest of the orchestra is playing. Very often you will find that the scherzo movement of a symphony is asked for this reason. This same excerpt could appear on an oboe audition, as they play almost exactly the same melody. In the scherzo, the Beethoven Third Symphony is often asked for a flute or violin audition. The scherzo from Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream is a standard audition piece on flute, oboe, clarinet, and again, the line in the solo must be smooth. This would not be acceptable. <laughs> As again, you hear the twa twa, this pushing of notes. It is rhythmic inaccuracy. Listen to this demonstration. This is not acceptable as the phrasing is dull, uninteresting, too straight. Now, here's an intonation problem that sometimes we hear. The top C is too sharp or too flat 
Whichever the case is, it must be exactly in tune. And it is preferable that you do not breathe after the long note, after the concert C. But if you must, make the breath sound like it belongs there. The mechanics of the breath, the respiration, are the bowing must not interrupt the phrase so as to distort the musical idea. Similar problems occur for the oboe in the second movement of the Brahms Violin Concerto and for the flute in the Afternoon of a Fawn by Debussy. Listen to the solo again and be aware of exact rhythm, contrasting dynamics, a very clean, clear sound, and a flowing line. The next solo you might find is probably the most famous solo in the French horn repertoire in terms of solo performances and auditions. I don't know of an audition where you would not play the Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony, the Andante Cantabile, the second movement. Now, the overall impression here is very important. You want to give your audience a sense of repose, of calmness, a gentle, beautiful sound that is magic. One's tone is primary in this piece. Since the piece is rather rhapsodic and rubato, rhythm is not as important as it was in the Brahms or the Beethoven examples. When playing the Tchaikovsky Fifth, if we were to hear something like this, it's pretty dull. It's in tune, it's rhythmically correct, but it's not very interesting. And it shows a lack of experience, maturity, a lack of expressiveness, and it does not display much personality. There must be personality. Yeah. 
Some orchestras may have different standards. Let me demonstrate again this woofing, this twa-twa effect that I was talking about. <laughs> That may be acceptable in some orchestras, as it is in tune and rhythmic, and there are no missed notes, but it would not be acceptable in, the, in most of the very fine orchestras. The next piece could be something to demonstrate technical prowess. A percussionist may be asked to play the xylophone part for the gallop from Kavalevsky's The Comedian. For oboe, the Rossini Overture, La Scala di Setta. For violin, Strauss's Ein Heldenleben. The famous horn solo, also by Richard Strauss, Till Eulenspiegel, appears on nearly every audition for the same reasons. <laughs> This demonstrates the technical prowess of the player through nearly a three octave range. When this was first performed, it posed great difficulty for the horn player. It's now so common that it's on every audition and most players toss it off as though it were nothing. The notes are exactly the same in both passages, but the tempo is not the same and the style is not exactly the same. It starts out almost flippantly in character with Till, the rogue. It speeds up in the third measure, then in the second call, it stays in the faster tempo and is louder. If the wrong length of note is played, it could sound like this. Neither of these is convincing. Often in auditions, the two passages are played exactly the same. That's not correct either. Once the eighth note starts speeding up, it must be consistent. I'll play it again. been covered so far in the audition, you will notice that we have had excerpts which demonstrate different aspects of musicianship and technique. We've had a lyrical solo in the middle register, which must show very good rhythm and intonation. We've played a lyrical solo which has a rubato feeling, which really shows the personality of the player. We've had a couple more technical passages the Beethoven sixth, which shows strict rhythm as well as a smooth line, and Till Eulenspiegel, which encompasses a wide tessitura, or range. We've also seen how these concepts may be applied to other instruments. Another point that the committee will look for is the ability to play in extreme registers and dynamic ranges. That may be difficult on your instrument. A violinist might expect to play the Mahler 10th Symphony. A flutist, the Prokofiev Classical Symphony. And on oboe, the Stravinsky Je Descartes. A piece asked on many auditions for both low and high horn auditions is a very soft passage from the beginning of Wagner's Das Rheingold.
You must play with smooth slurs and even sound and in tune and in rhythm through a two and a half octave range. That's a very important solo and a rather scary moment when you actually perform it in the orchestra and an audition for that matter. The opening of the Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony is a good example of fortissimo playing. In a 2D passage, which requires excellent sound in fortissimo, good rhythm, and intonation, and a very authoritative quality of playing. <laughs> Also be a solo to demonstrate your low register. It could be a quiet passage or a very loud one, as a wide dynamic contrast is expected of us. I'm going to play a tutti passage from the Shostakovich Fifth Symphony, which demonstrates a very smooth, steady, steady tone, but loud in the lower range. A strong forte that you would have to play in any, any position in the horn section. One of the most popular and called upon excerpts to play for the French horn is the Siegfried horn call. It demonstrates power and virility in the high register. One must have a very good 6-8 lilt and a particular style that is indigenous to Wagner. And in general, a kind of playing that every conductor wants to hear. At this point, the audition may become more specialized according to the position and the instrument for which you are auditioning. If the audition is for bass clarinet, contrabassoon, piccolo, and so on, you must also play clarinet, bassoon, and flute, respectively, to demonstrate your control of those instruments. And if the audition is for a utility player, you will be expected and asked to play high, low, middle, soft, loud, short, long, every possible notation that we are required to do in the orchestra. Be able to exaggerate everything. Dynamics, range, articulation, tone color, as you are playing for the entire audience, not just yourself. When preparing these excerpts, it is advisable to read from the actual orchestral part, if possible. I've heard people play beautifully in the main part of a solo and miss several notes in the next passage because they've never seen it before. Sometimes a player will perform the most difficult passages perfectly and miss something simple that follows because they lose their concentration by giving themselves premature self-congratulation. I have not yet emphasized another area that the committee will be listening for, and that is the ability to change 
tone color, tone quality, timbre, to fit the demands of the music or the composer or the orchestra. It is very impressive to hear a person play and sound like a different player from one piece to the next as the music dictates. On any instrument, if you're asked to play a range of composers, be prepared to approach each with a different tonal sense. A French piece followed by a classic piece followed by a romantic excerpt should demonstrate noticeable differences in sound. For instance, in the Ravel Pavane, you should have a very innocent, lovely sound, perhaps with a little vibrato. That is followed by a classic excerpt, say, the minuet movement of the Mozart 40th Symphony in G minor, a very clear, simple sound with no vibrato. To demonstrate a full, rich, broad sound, I will play the solo from the finale of Brahms' first symphony. Here we want a very dark, deep, rich, thick kind of sound that should be obviously different from the Ravel and Mozart. Those three solos should demonstrate very different tone colors. On every instrument, this kind of discernment, this ability to change tone color is desirable and necessary. You should be adaptable to the solo, the period of music, the section that you want to play in, the desires of the conductor, the principal player, and so on. As musicians, you should be able to apply musically the concepts that I have demonstrated on my instrument, the horn, to your instrument, and the repertoire that you will be asked to prepare for future auditions. Careful examination and study should help you determine, as I have demonstrated, factors that the audition committee will be particularly aware of. I hope that I've touched on many topics that will be helpful in the preparations for your next audition physically, psychologically, practically, and musically. I hope that your next audition will be better than your last and that it will be a successful one so that you may find a rewarding and successful musical career. Mm -hmm.